Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good looking out, Miss Flowers. Okay, um, I know you just had lunch and I just had an exciting walk from Golden Bay to get here. So um, can we try something really quick just to introduce what I want to do? Can you stand up and put your hands on your hip? This should be one of the most go-to positions as a teacher. Let's own our space, own that little spot on the ground, and your hand absolutely needs to be on your hip for this to work. Everybody with me? Okay, now you have to be a little bit quiet so that I don't yell into the mic. Just a little bit quiet with your hand on your hip. I will give you a sentence and I will ask that you repeat it in whatever voice you feel comfortable. I am a big deal. I teach the leaders of tomorrow. Yeah, you have a seat. All right, so I hope, I hope you're a different day today. I won't say it's a day off, but I hope your different day today inspires you to go into your classroom or your office or whatever capacity you serve your school with that attitude because we are all teachers. So whether you're the bus driver, the librarian, it is your responsibility to be a part of shaping our young people. The smile you give your student might be the only one they get for that day. So don't underestimate your role. So if I have your attention, so I'm going to have to be a teacher for a little bit because as a principal, I don't get to go into the classroom. So if I have your attention, it means that if I look at you, you're looking back at me. It also gives me the feedback to let me know if what I am saying, if I need to pivot, I can. But if I see you doing this, then that means I'm on the right track. It's the hardest thing to present to our peers. It's the hardest thing, yet we require it of our students just like that. So I'm going to ask you to please give me good feedback by meeting my eyes whenever I look for you and to give me feedback by either telling me, no, Jamie, no, or, I hear you, I hear you. Deal? Okay. One of my favorite quotes talks about the impact of a teacher. So I am married to a leader. My husband is in charge of public service, and the longest ministry, public service, political reform, religious affairs, all of the letters. But I tell him all the time that the people who are shaping this country are the teachers. Because we work, and I'm happy to say that he appreciates that role. Because at the end of the day, what the government has to work with are what we give them. If we give them poor workers, people who don't show up on time, people who don't appreciate skills like initiative and meeting deadlines and doing your best job the first time, and doing something that you know needs to be done before they ask you to do it, then the government will have less to work with. So you see the connection. And then when you get to the hospital on the day you're going to deliver your baby or take out your kidney stone because we have to hold in our pee, you might have to say, which school you graduate from? And you don't want to be on the table when the question is asked. You want to just say, I can come to the hospital safely. So as our role as teachers, we have to tap into one of the most natural talents of all Belizeans. We are naturally curious. You meet any Belizean, they will try to track down your family history, your boyfriend record, your address, everything, your granny, write down. Part of being a teacher is appreciating what we have to work with. 
And what I have realized is the best job in the world is teaching Belizean students because that is the job of teachers. We have to inspire curiosity. We have to ask them, ask why. Keep asking. If you get a question, don't stop until you get the right answer. Don't let one thing stop you. Try, try again. And so I am here, not necessarily only to promote the involvement of this event, but to inspire you as an educator in what is happening through this event. Because we have to be the driving force to let the next cohort of graduates be that when we go into any service, whether it's government, private, or organizational, that we are working with people who are on the best of their game, who can give us the bang for our buck, who make us feel welcome. So from traveling to coming back to the airport, to Chetomal border, to hospital, to land department, we will change the face of this country if we impact how our people treat one another. And my school has had the pleasure and the honor of representing Belize in a number of debates over the past 10 years. So you stick with what you know, but you also keep exploring. And so we want to bring debate as a national platform in the next school year. And what we wanted to do this school year is pitch the value of debate across the board. So in debate, you have a wide range of the benefits in and out of the classroom and both for you as an adult and them as a student. You can be a better negotiator, you can be a better thinker, you can develop an evidence-based argument. Part of debate is not quarreling. Debate is saying an opinion, but then you have to back it up. And it can't be because I feel so. You can't tell me that because I know how I feel. My spirit just not taken. That's not evidence. Your spirit can't vouch for you. You have to give real hardcore evidence in order for your opinion to be valued. Secondary, you can't just be the loudest voice in the room. You just have to be the voice that's making the most compelling argument. Because guess what happened? The louder they scream, the quicker they'll lose their voice, and then you get to make your point uninterrupted. Think about having thousands and thousands of students graduate from our schools with the ability to appreciate another person's opinion without feeling the need to cut down the person. Think about how much less quarrels in our homes, in our communities, even our neighborhood. Think about our squabbles that extend to things like thoughtlessness. Your neighbor put out the garbage knowing that the dog won't tear it up knowing that you want to go out there and pick up her garbage. Little things like that is what we have the opportunity to shape in our small country. Because yes, we are small, but that gives us the ability to see change even quicker. And the best way to change a country is to put it as a rule in a school. So again, that's another part to you. However, it comes with the responsibility of knowing what you have access to knowing when you had your baby if you had a baby when you got to leave the hospital you may or may not have left with a birth certificate but you didn't get a handbook when miss josephine mommy left the hospital she did not get a little handbook that says this is how josephine will need to be treated we don't get that as parents however as citizens the document we inherit on how we are treated is called our constitution. And I can tell you, part of my excitement with this exercise is that for the most part of my life, I can't tell you the constitution ever registered as a document I think I needed to know. In high school, we had one class, one teacher that was afraid of it, and so we just basically read through it one day. A show of hands if you have legitimately thought about the Constitution this much before. Okay, so we have one brave soul. Power to you, sir. However, the point of the Constitution is that it gives us 
a handbook on being a good citizen. And it's not just about keeping us in line. It's about our ability to, to speak our voice, to take action, to share our ideas. We live in a beautiful Belize where if you want to say you're Catholic, you're Muslim, you're Islam, we live in a country that that doesn't come with any kind of negative behavior. Right next door, Nicaragua, the Jesuits are being kicked out of Nicaragua, forced out of their homes. Our neighborhood as a region is stifled. Their citizens don't have their freedoms that we have here. And that is something given to us in part two of the Constitution of Belize. And that's where I have asked all principals that I had access to so far before today, I had access to the high school principals, I am asking that we put the list of freedoms and responsibilities to our young people. And we ask them the debate question, are our current freedoms and rights enough? And I want them to tell me if they think it's enough or if they think something should be added in there. And so I'm asking for eight students from different schools to work together because again, it's not one versus the other. So it might be a school from Palote, Ocean Academy, Mopantec, whatever schools you are imagining there. One student, we will have a debate in our gym and they will be researching and presenting on live stream what they think are either, yes, it's enough, or no, not enough. And so I'm asking you as educators to inspire that curiosity and to help me, not necessarily as quick as, as us in September, but to help me help us help our future by finding out how they can continue to be curious about what rights and responsibilities they have. I also want to take this opportunity to inspire you by telling you that for the most part, historians don't always let you in on their little secret. History is made every day. This event is history. You get to choose besides how you will stand up in front of your students, besides how prepared you are. You get to choose if you will be a witness or if you will be a contributor. And that will be a defining moment for you as a teacher because you should never be a witness in your classroom. You should always be a contributor because I will tell you, they will forget the math formula, the poem, they might remember a piece of it, but they will not forget if you were a student a teacher who made them feel inspired, who motivated them, who pushed them. And this document is something that they will inherit. Their rights and freedoms will be included in this move. We can't be a country of constantly changing. The, co the days of COVID taught us that. We mustn't forget COVID, we must remember COVID. But the whole thing about Uncle coming on TV and tell us, when you wake up tomorrow, you could put on the mask. When you sleep tonight, you could take it off. Those days over, we can't be willy-nilly with our laws. Our contribution to this whole event should be that our constitution is rooted in the general ideas, but that is something that we can hold firm to. Because when you give your handbook out to your parents at school, you can't change that by the week. You have to give that out in fairness to your community that what you asked for in the beginning is what you will stand by out throughout because that's the only way they will be good students for you. You will lose the faith of your parents if you constantly change the rules. Yes or no? You can't change the rules. If you play sports, you can't say, oh, the first three shots gone in too easy, so raise the rim three more feet because the Lee Young Man from EP York, he too good, he can blow it out. Can't do that. So our constitution needs to be something that we can hold on to.
in as much as unchangeable as possible because the spirit of our constitution will be the spirit of our citizens. If you feel secure in your rights and your freedoms, you will feel secure as a citizen. And a good Belizean can move mountains because we are not good Belizeans alone. If you've ever had anything to do in Belize, everybody, family, knows somebody who could help you. And that is my beautiful Belize. Because between mommy, auntie, sister, neighbor, friend, work, boss, you need a passport tomorrow, it could happen. Yes or no? Especially teachers, because we know everybody. You need a donation, you look up your parents and you say, ooh, he won this business. Yeah, could help we. That's our beauty. That's what we have to tap into. What we want to get done can get done. My final pitch, because my time is up. I would like to ask you to pay attention to the fact that our constitution determines what laws can be created. Our constitution determines what laws can be created. As people working with young students, as young as eight are reporting to our school with devices that are connected online. There were important updates to our laws on cyber crime. Parents are accountable for the creation and distribution of pornographic images. Cyberbullying is now punishable by law. It's not just a school issue that we have to fix. It's not just an awkward parent meeting. Parents now have the option to take each other to court. So I'm asking um, that you be inspired by the fact that we have to protect our students because whether they're the perpetrator or the victim, they are our students. And nobody that young determined is supposed to be determining their life choices where they get to work how they're treated because big people and older people and younger people bullies exist everywhere so some of them will get bullied into their adulthood and facebook is seemingly forever because there's always a one friend who remember everything and there's always a one friend who save every picture and they just wait until something is going good in your life and then post it and tag you and your ma and your husband and your picnic. So I'm asking, I will send a video that one of um, the parents at my school created, Mr. Jose Alpuche, created a little video on what are the important notes. And I got his permission to share it with you as a school. You can email it out to your parents. And I invite you to reach out to the lawyers in your own community and find out about those changes because those impact who we serve. So if you are interested in joining our debate, I'm asking that you reach out to Mr. Chris DeShiel. He got a package. It outlines exactly how we will push the debate. It outlines how you can conduct your own debate and you can contact us if you need any further support. But I ask you once again, please be inspired. Please be a contributor to this history-making event. This will determine the future of Belize. And if you are a teacher, we all know we don't do it for the salary. We do it for the smiles you get 10 years later when you meet them in the store and they're introducing you to their children and they introduce you and say, you see this lady, you see this man? Or they come to you and they say, miss, I have my grandson to come up. You better be there when they reach you. So you trust in the ability to show up with your best every day because that is your role and that's why we need to be attentive to the resources that are being made available to us we have the opportunity to contribute. So thank you very much. Sorry for going past my time. Thank you, Mrs. Usher.
for your lovely presentation. We now proceed into the question and answer session. This will be hosted by Mr. Joshua Pott. Mr. Pott is the moderator. Good afternoon once again. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Joshua Pott. He's a resident of Belmopan. He's a policy analyst at the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and he's a commissioner on the PCC, People's Constitution Commission, representing the Belize Chamber of Commerce. Joshua's role will be to field your questions. He will be asking you if he's not clear on exactly what you're trying to develop. Um, and please, there's no wrong question that you might have for the presenters. Uh, Josh will take the questions, direct them. If you're not satisfied with the response, please let's engage. Everything is going to be recorded because what you share helps us to understand what you're thinking. So please join me in welcoming Commissioner Joshua Park. Hey, good afternoon, teachers. Um, before we get into the actual question and answer session, I just wanted to take the opportunity of having this platform to thank everybody who at one point or the other taught me in school. Um, I think being in the workforce for a few years now, I miss school because working is hard. <laughs> um, so, and I see a couple of my teachers in the room already. Thank you very much for everything that you've, you've given me. Thank you for the patience that you've exercised. So thank you to all of you teachers, even the teachers who disciplined me. Yes, even you guys, even you guys. So we'll jump straight into the question and answer segment. So I, will, I would invite anybody who has a question, the mic is in the middle, if you can state your name, maybe the school that you come from, if you're comfortable, and we could, we could get things started. Good afternoon. And is it Oliveira, Oliveira Trinity Methodist School? Um, earlier I was listening, oh, and thank you all for your presentation this morning, um, Mr. Ed and Mr. Bradley. Thank you, very informative. My question has to do with something that Mr. Bradley said as it relates to permanent secretaries moving into no-call CEOs. But we are permanent secretaries moving into no-call CEOs. But um, you said something interesting as it relate, related to contract workers, right? So there, that is where my question is headed because I know that we have a contractor general and I am of the opinion, and I could be corrected, that contractor general is to vet whatever contracts that the government has. However, I know of a situation that a person had to wait to get employed for the, from the approval of the contractor general. Is that something that is normal? That a contractor general have to approve your employment before you could start working? Mr. Bradley, I believe the question was directed to you. When you're ready to respond. So the, yeah, yeah. so the contractor general's power is to review and make comments in relation to government contracts. The contractor general doesn't exactly. necessarily approve the contract. So it's, it would be an anomaly that the contractor general's approval would be needed for the contract to take effect. But the contractor general does have the power and authority and duty by the legislation to review and make input to the National Assembly on all government contracts. So you're saying to me that even in the case of employment? All contracts. All contracts for government, there's a review. They can't, they're not given authority to approve the contract but they are given authority to review and then to report to the National Assembly. And there's a provision in their law that they have to say whether or not in their opinion the contract is in the public interest. 
Okay. And if it is not in the public interest, they can report their comments and their opinion to the National Assembly and the National Assembly can take it up. That is a mechanism similar to the Auditor General that is a check and balance done by legislation. So you have these various oversight offices like the Contractor General that deals with contracts and the Auditor General that deals with government accounts that could make reports. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, um, Ms. Oliveira. Uh, can we invite somebody else up to the mic with their question or comment? We will wait for you, um, Mr. Vasquez. Uh, good afternoon, Joshua. Good afternoon, Joshua. Gian Vasquez from St. John's College. Uh, first question before I begin, and I hope you indulge me for a little bit, have a conversation with you guys. Uh, first off, the commission. Is it making a new constitution, or is it just reviewing the present constitution to strengthen the check and balances, as you all mentioned? Is it a new constitution, or is it just strengthening the present constitution. Yes, the work of the commission by law, PCC Act number 28 of 2022, basically has two functions. One, do a comprehensive review Constitution of Belize with all its ten amendments, consult the people of Belize for their views and opinions and those living abroad, and whatever the people of Belize say, we are to write it down in a report and present it. So we are looking at the existing Constitution of Belize. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm going to speak so that uh, my opinion is noted as part of the jobs that the job that you all are doing. Uh, I want to begin first off, I'm going to look at several parts of the Constitution that I think need strengthening. Or, as you all mentioned, for checks and balances to be improved. When you all started, I think Mr. Usher, he talked about uh, part one of the Constitution. He talked about supremacy of the Constitution. And he said that part one says that the Constitution of Belize is the supreme law of Belize. Right? So I want to make note that I don't think you went into 2.2 because 2.2, it says that the word other laws do not apply to constitutional amendments that are passed in relation to section 69. The effect of that section 2.2 is that constitutional amendments do not have that constitutional guarantee where Section 96 can be activated for judicial review to occur. What am I saying? I'm saying that 2.2 has created a hole in our constitution. And that hole is that anything that goes in terms of constitutional amendments have, or by right, have what we refer to as parliamentary supremacy. All constitutional amendments. Why? Because it cannot be challenged in a court of law unless you challenge section 69, which is the process by which that amendment is made. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Because that is in there, if the present government, and let's say for argument's sake, just for entertainment purposes, the government of today has an Ashley Rock as the representative for the churches that votes with the government all the time. If the government today decides having super majority, the three-fourths, says I want to change the entire constitution. Given it's 90 days, takes it to the Senate, the Senate votes, ratifies six members of the People's United Party with one social partner, then that changes. So it gives them, it gives the ability of the present government to create or any government. Because Mr. Osha said, 
if you are afraid of something being or infringing of, on your constitutional right in the future, you should be able to take it to court. But you can't, can you? You can't take an amendment to court and ask for judicial review because of that 2.2 that was included. So I can't ask the government or I can't ask the judiciary to review it. The only recourse left to us Belizeans is to become violent. And so I say, take that out. If you want to strengthen the Constitution, then you need to change that. If you want to check and balance, then you res restore the ability of the judiciary to check and balance the legislature, even when it comes to constitutional amendments. Mr. Vasquez, can we stick a pin right there and allow somebody I have a lot more the, now. <laughs> the, the, um, what the re any reactions, um, Mr. Osha? Like I, like I indicated, section two, subsection two, was not in the original 1981 constitution. That was an amendment. And like 11 I said, of 2011. And like I said, prior to that was the case, the Barry Boeing case with the... Um, I think you mix it up because 20, 11 of 2011 is the takeover of BL. No, I'm talking BTL. about... BTL. I'm, no, I'm, I'm referring to a case, the Barry Bowen case. The Barry know, Bowen one? The court. I know about the BTL one, but I'm saying that Contest said in the Barry Bowen case that the, he spoke to the, the, um, the status of the Constitution, the fundamental structure of the Constitution. But the amendment in Subsection 2 made that nullify, kind of nullify that doctrine. And so, as you rightfully said, the alteration, once it is done with the, within the proper procedure and processes of Section 69, it cannot be deemed to be unconstitutional. Now, just like, as you said, and I am saying, it wasn't in the 1981 Constitution, it was amended to include it, then perhaps that could be a suggestion that it, it be taken out. I am not... Um, I, am, I, I am not the, the powers to do it, but I understand what you're saying. So if it was including, included after the 1981 Constitution, then in this, maybe that suggestion can be made so to take it out. So, but, I'm, but I am here to just discuss and explain what obtains in the Constitution as, at present. But that's a good observation, and so thanks for your contribution as well as that. I have a slightly different take, and Mr. Usher had mentioned this earlier on, which is the basic structure document, and I'll go back there very quickly and briefly. And what that decision that he referred to says, and what the basic structure doctrine says, is that there are certain principles that are basic and fundamental to the existence of the state. So one has to appreciate that the rights in the Constitution are human rights. They've been codified by the Constitution, but they're human rights that actually predate the Constitution. And the basic structure says that certain things in the Constitution are immutable. They cannot be changed. And I'll give you an example. I, Daryl Bradley, cannot pass a law in this country that says women cannot vote. I can't. So even if I were to purport to pass that law, and even if I were to follow the amending provisions in the Constitution, that law will have no validity because it offends the basic structure of the Constitution. So that I suspect if they invoke that provision, it would be challenged in court, and courts in other jurisdictions has affirmed the basic structure document that certain fundamental rights, things which are universally accepted, they cannot be changed. The second thing is I would challenge the notion that you had mentioned, which you speak about, you, I, I believe you used the word that you would become violent. The idea with the Constitution is that if you do not like the Constitution, if you do not like an amendment, the Constitution has a process for that, which is the political process. 
So no part of our law and no part of appreciating what the rule of law is speaks to violence. If you do not like an amendment, go to a public consultation and share your opinion. Run for office, campaign, and challenge it in the democratic process, which is what the Constitution says, that we are a rule of law state. And to my knowledge, no government since independence has passed any law that offends the basic structure of the Constitution because we all accept the principle of legitimacy and universal and fundamental rights. I, I knew you, had brought, you would bring that up, right? I, I thought that for a moment, yes, you would bring that up because uh, to defend that 2.2, uh, the then the Inbarra government not only changed that, they also in section 69 making amendments. The last section that says, for the removal of doubts, it's hereby declared that the provisions of this section are all inclusive and exhaustive, and there is no other limitation, uh, whether substantive or procedural, on the power of the National Assembly. Which means that what you said just now in terms of basic structure, this is saying that that does not exist, that the power on the legislature to amend by including this, and again, it's a then the Inbarra government that included two of those things. For, for the courts to not be able to challenge and take to litigation the acquisition of BTL. And so this causes your basic structure argument to go to pieces. The point is, if we have any disagreement as to what the law means, the Constitution deals with that. We take it to court. And courts have said in other countries, the basic structure document comes from India. Courts have said that even amendments to the Constitution are unconstitutional. So the point of being a rule of law state, it means that if we disagree, we do not go to violence. We do not challenge people in ways that would undermine the democratic process. You are saying something, and I disagree with what you're saying. And if I disagree with what you're saying, I follow the democratic process. I go to court. The court may say that I am right. The court may say that you are right. But we follow the lawfully established rule of law process. And I am saying to you that that provision in the Constitution cannot be enforced because it cannot violate the basic structure document. And if I am wrong, then I would take it to court and I would put this hypothesis. If I again pass a law that says women cannot vote, I will go to court and no court will say that just by following that provision, women can't vote. It offends the basic structure and that's a well-established constitutional rule. So additional question, what you're saying is if I choose to do so with this public, with this commission here, by virtue of what is in the Constitution in present, I can ask the Supreme Court for judicial review that what you are doing right now in terms of or when the amendment process starts, that I can ask for judicial review. And the court is going to grant me leave for judicial review for an amendment. The court may not say that you're correct, but the right is that you have the right of due process. You can always petition the courts. And trust me, I'm a lawyer. People sue the government all the time. But it not is for one amendments. Of our... Not for amendments based on this. They can sue based on that. One of the things that I love about this country is that we live in a rule of law okay. state. You can go to court and you can sue any member of society. And that's one of the beauties of the Constitution. The Constitution itself establishes itself as the fundamental law. So if you disagree with me, you go to court. If you disagree with any law, any law, even a constitutional amendment, go to court. Okay, so I'm, as I said, I'm just going to put it for the record, right? So that's one. I'm going to go down where I think the Constitution is lacking and needs revision. So section five, fundamental rights. I'm just putting it on the record, right? Uh, in it, section five, it talks about upon reasonable suspicion. I think they're to strengthen our rights as citizens against the law officers, that needs to be reviewed. Things like upon reasonable suspicion, who decides reasonable suspicion? Is it the police? Is there a policy for reasonable suspicion? 
I think that needs to be strengthened. I think you can't leave it up to the police for them to have reasonable suspicion. I think there's, there needs to be something in the Constitution that determines due process in that, in that regard. Yes, the court has, in several decisions, I think two recent CAD was one of them with the President Attorney General was the attorney, where the court discussed what reasonable uh, suspicion is. And so case law will dictate what reasonable suspicion is. So the police might arrest you and based on reasonable suspicion, you get your attorney, you go to court, and you find out the reasonable suspicion was not one that the court defines as what reasonable suspicion is. The Constitution is a broad document with broad um, wording, and so the court, as I said earlier, when I was mentioning the three pillars, executive, legislative, and judicial, and I said that the judicial branch, which are the courts, they are the jealous guardian of the Constitution, and they say what the law is, or they interpret the laws. So that would be a matter for the court to decide what reasonable suspicion is. So I want to continue, right? <laughs> just to put it on record, uh, section, just for context, what I want to put is that there is kind of discrepancy in the Constitution, because in section 29, it states that if you are a country that does not recognize the independence of Belize, then citizen is denied to you. citizenship is denied to you. If you are a citizen of a country who does not recognize Belize. But if you are Guatemalan and you come to Belize and you nationalize, you can run for election. And if you are a Belizean who goes to the US, you can't run for election if you become an American citizen. I think the law, and I, I'm just putting it down for it to be noted that the Constitution should say that people who are born in Guatemala are completely banned even if they become Belizeans from running for elections. I think only Belizeans should be able to stand for election. If you're banned here, you're banned here. I'm going to continue, right, because Mr. Bradley and Mr. Usher are talking about checks and balances. Uh, section 59 of the Constitution that deals with crossing the floor. I think that should completely be taken out of the Constitution. Why? Because it only serves political parties. But when you go to an election, although you run on a platform of either PUP, UDP, independent people vote for you as well. And if you choose to go against your party's wishes and you are removed from the National Assembly, you are disenfranchising the people who voted independent for those people. And I think that person should not be disqualified only to, or something should be put in there that maybe a uh, uh, recall mechanism can be put in there. Not removal. Let the people decide if they want to remove that person or not. So again, I just want to put that in there that that should be removed, crossing the floor from the Constitution. Uh, I, in that, I also think, for example, currently we have a problem with uh, the area rep from Queen Square not going to, uh, to meetings at the house. I think there should be in place something to ensure that people who are elected do the job of an elected official. That they not get paid for some job that they are not doing. And I think the Constitution should include that. You missed two? Well, let's start the recall mechanism for you. I also think that in terms of powers, procedures, in terms of the legislature, I have lots of powers, procedures. I think there should be uh, an insertion in that section that says alteration of the Senate must at all time ensure that the ruling party does not have more members than the opposition and social partners together the composition that exists now. I think that going forward to ensure there is a check and balance in the bicameral legislature that we use, the Senate should at all times have majority together with the, the social partners, oppositions, more than the ruling party. Right now, right? And that brings me to another one, right? Because in 2008, I don't know if Belizeans have short-term memory, but 2008, 
the people voted in elections for a new government and for a 13th senator. And that 13th senator was not installed till 2016. And to not allow that to occur ever again, I think something should be put in our constitution that reads something like this, whereby by referendum, the Belizean population has voted for changes in the constitution. The prime minister has 30 days to sign and enact such law. And by inserting that, then section 96 of our constitution, the judicial review process can be instituted and an act or a writ of mandamus can be used against the prime minister that does not act in accordance to what the people want. And finally, I think some amendments should also be made to section 74 as it relates to decorum in the house. Because decorum, because as pre at present, they can say whatever they want and they have immunity. And I think at some point, uh, the people of Belize should say, you know what, we hold you at a higher level. That back and forth, uh, insulting each other, that's unbecoming of Belizeans, right? That does not speak of us. I, for one, don't think that represents me in the house. And so I think that the Constitution should include something of that sort to deal with the decorum that occurs in that house. Uh, that's it, right? Thank you for the time. Thank you. I don't know if there is a reaction from the panel before we, we move on. Um. I would just like to place on record that the work of the PCC, the People's Constitution Commission, is not to amend the Constitution, but in fact, as I said earlier, to record your views. The report goes to the Prime Minister. That report is laid to cabinet and to the house. And if in the opinion of the House of Representatives there are sufficient reasons to amend, repeal, or new, that is put to a referendum. There has been a commitment that all recommendations to be considered by referendum. But the law is very specific. We do not amend the Constitution. That's not in our remit. I just wanted to place that on record. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. I think we can have the other question. Good afternoon. It's more a statement, a little venting, but I do welcome a response after. Abigail Hoare, um, State of Renan Technical High School. Uh, I really appreciate what my colleague shared about the character that we desire and expect in the house. Um, I will go as far as saying if the teachers of those gentlemen and women in the house are still alive, I don't know if they would be very proud to say I taught that one. Um, not true or not true? Thank you. Um, when I heard him say that just now, I thought about how, I thought about the four corners of my classroom as an educator and what I expect of my students. Honestly, up to this very point, I have no desire to expose my children to the House of Representatives. It's sad, but it's true because what I, what I witness there goes against everything that I try to instill in them and what I myself try to live up to. Yeah, the moment we slip up as a teacher though, the, the table turns on against us, right? However, as educators, because we do know better, uh, the book starts with us, we do know how, uh, we do know what we should be and how we should carry ourselves. Um, with all of that said, the statement that I came to make is 
I honestly agree with Mr. Bradley about the our laws that need the, the structures that needs to be revetted. It's created in such a way that the people with the higher power continue to abuse the system, continue, they have power, they have autonomy to continue to abuse and manipulate our system and our structures. And unfortunately, the heart of man is desperately wicked. And so wicked men and women continue to make wicked um, decisions that oppress the already oppressed, which is wicked, and they will appear on Judgment Day. That's what the song say. Sorry, I'm also a messenger of God, so I, I encourage grace first, and then if you had a hearing, then you will appear. Um, my statement here comes my statement. I really do love and appreciate our policies and one of it insists that the person who desires to go in the classroom must be qualified. It's a lot of work to remain qualified, but the children do deserve a qualified, passionate, committed, educated teacher. They deserve nothing less. In the same way, that's what countries, that's what this country deserves in its leaders of the country. I believe that something needs to be adjusted, some amendment needs to be made. I believe some colleagues told me this exists in some countries. I don't know why it doesn't exist here, but we need to consider that our politicians are qualified to lead the four corners of this country. If teachers are expected to be qualified to manage the four corners of a classroom and with their principals and administrators manage the four corners of a school, even more so, that expectation should be given upon those who desire to run a country. You want to run the country and you have no qualifications for the ministry that is given into your hands. It really is insane. And that's one of the reasons why I believe we're not being as effective as we can be in the ministerial areas. Listen, a minister is called a minister because you offer a service. You are a servant. They don't operate as that instead Many are operating, many, not all, many are operating as if though they are to be served. And to be honest, colleagues, we, some of us, have caused them to believe that because we worship them and we don't hold our leaders accountable respectfully. So we need to get ourselves in check too. I can speak clearly because I'm not one of them. But if any of us are here and we have been guilty of that, for the sake of our future generation, we must change that now. Thank you. Are there any reactions from the, the panel? I just wanted to make one comment, and this is on the Constitution itself. I think the last speaker and the previous speaker spoke about code of conduct. There is a code of conduct in the Constitution and there is subsidiary legislation that deals with that. One of the things that you may want to look at, examine, comment on is that when we do codes of conduct, it tends to be negative. Do not engage in conflicts of interest. Do not engage in misuse of power. Do not do this, do not do that. But the other countries have statements in their Constitution and the subsidiary laws that are positive that say that this is the kind of leader that we want. For example, no part of the Constitution t uses the word ethics. No part of the Constitution uses the word character. So that you can look at something that would be more positive as to shaping the kind of person that you want rather than being negative as don't do this and don't do that.
I would just like to comment the, the persons running for government position or area representatives as we presently have. We have to, if we are going to put certain requirements as to who may run, we have to really think about that because we have students, we have persons who are not necessarily academically oriented. Some of them are into, there someone could be a carpenter. Are we going to say because a carpenter does not have certain academic um, what's its degree, bachelor's, master's, etc., it won't be able to run? There was a time in this country and in the Commonwealth Caribbean, just after slavery, when the ex-slave masters wanted to continue to control this, the, the freed persons now, they said in order for you to vote, you have to own land, you have to this. So it seems as we are coming full circle. I am just, I'm not saying that it's not a good point, I'm just saying that that one needs some serious examination because not everyone is academically oriented. So when we look at that one and we say what is required for you to run, we have to be very careful as to how we will frame it. So, okay, just a so, comment. Um, so, I'd like to share my opinion on Abby's opinion. Um, I see where she's coming from. I, but I would like to remind many of us that there were many of us who were not qualified to be in the classroom before we entered the classroom. But when you entered the classroom, you were required to be qualified. So I would like to amend that idea, and it's very similar to what you're saying, that if somebody wants to run for office, they must agree to be prepared to, to, be, to be educated to run that office, all right? So then, could we then have our constitution require that within, because for us, when we get a provisional license, within five years, you have a ready fee in a classroom. So could we require that within a year or two years, that person has been trained to be in that position? Now, in addition, in addition to this, I would like to speak to, and we started with it, the equality of citizens. I have an issue with the fact that the Constitution does not, is not, not have enough teeth when it comes to the equality of citizens. Because I get very, very upset when in the profession that I am, I am almost right away held accountable for my actions, but there are other citizens who provide service to this country who are never held accountable. All right? When we look at the Code of Conduct, uh, the Code of Conduct specifies about the fact that you can't act, like you said, in conflict of interest towards uh -huh, use their office for private gain, etc., etc., etc. We have seen so many times in the news where we have people, public officers, who have been using their offices for private gain, and there's no accountability, none. All right, and if it comes up in the news, it means that somebody found out and somebody outed it. So I would like to see that the Constitution has a little bit more teeth when it comes to the equality of citizens, particularly when it comes to accountability. All right, um, 
I would like so I would also like to in addition to that look at does the Constitution I have to ask because I don't know uh, is there a provision in the Constitution for citizens to be provided with the, the at least adequate to the best service so is there somewhere where it is required that when like you said about the structure of public service right where when however um SIs or whatever instrument governs a particular department the police the health or yes that we there is something in the constitution that requires that these these rules and laws that govern those require at least the, the best service for the least of us back to equality because i'm finding that there is a lot of inequity and inequality in the service to those of us who are poor and there is no recourse for me to require that public facilities provide me the same service as it provides that person who can pull out a water cash and say do this so is there something in the constitution that when any rules or laws or anything that governs service force those people to provide equality of service, especially the public service. When I go to KHMH, I am not getting the best service. And there's a reason for that, right back to the code of conduct. Many people at the KHMH use the KHMH to refer people to private facilities and we get substandard care because they want to force you to go to private facilities that's the whole point right now of our public health service to force you to go to private facilities what recourse do i have legally constitutionally to demand that they give me the best service is is there any I just wanted to make two quick interventions. Number one is, and I don't know if this was part of the question, but just recognizing that when we deal with the rights that Mr. Usher was mentioning, those rights are political rights. So you would have the right to life, mm -hmm. you have the right to a certain quality of life, freedom of association, freedom of expression, and then you have certain due process rights. When you go to the police, they have to give you bail and things like that. They're political rights. Our constitution doesn't speak to economic rights nor social rights. Okay. So you don't have a right to land. You don't have a right to a job. You don't have the right to a basic standard of living. So that our constitution only speaks to political rights. There could be discussions or comments in relation to other rights because other countries include things in their constitution. The second point that I wanted to mention very quickly is that a lot of what you're saying is very important and it is fundamental because it goes to the delivery of public services. And when the constitution section six gives you the right of equality before the law and equal protection before the law. That includes equality of service so that mm -hmm. when I go and I access services, it should be the same as when somebody else goes and access that service. Mm -hmm. But a big part of that has to do with the service provider, the institutions and persons in government. And this is one of the points that goes back to the previous statement. A big part of our constitution and a big part of our law is silent on the question of ethics. Yeah. It's silent on the question of performance. So that I see the gentleman behind you, one of the things that I remember that I used to do from when I was a child, 
I have never littered, never littered. And for my, I knew myself, I've never littered. I'm 44 years old and I've never littered. No law needs to tell me do not throw trash on the street. So that there has to be a part of our discussion, a corollary to it that talks about being a good and ethical public officer, being a good and ethical leader, those positive things that you want to inspire. Because when we talk about accountability, when we talk about transparency, we oftentimes talk about, okay, that person thief, lock up. And we don't look at the structural and the attitudes and values that we would want to shape. The previous speaker, Ms. Usher, mentioned about shaping the future leaders. That's a conversation about ethics and shaping people with the kind of values that would go into the National Assembly and act with a way that reflects decorum. And that is something that needs to be said in the Constitution. It is not there. It tells you don't act in a conflict of interest, don't misuse your power, but it doesn't tell us what we want. It tells us what we don't want. Another thing about this, I would just add very quickly, is that there is a provision in there about citizenship. To be a Belizean citizen, you're born a Belize, you marry a Belizean, you're naturalized. But even this question of civic responsibility and the duties and obligations of a citizen and what we want in a citizen, Constitution not tell you that. So there could be certain language, it may not be enforceable language, but there should be some language in there that tells us positively what we want in a leader. We want a person of ethics. We want a person of this. We want a person of that. So, what is so it that we want we in a citizen? Could I then request that? Could I then officially request that there is language in the Constitution, particularly when it comes to public service and the equality all right, of citizens? So with public service, we want people to be hired and kept, not just hired, on their, their ethics, all right? But, uh, they, well, it's their qualification, but they're, they're not just their paper qualifications, but their moral qualifications, all right? Um, but also, when it comes to the equality of citizens, I don't really want to leave it to the ethics of the public officer to keep up with their position, with the knowledge of their position. It is not left to us. We are required to keep up our training regularly. So back to equality, I would like the language of the Constitution to positively reinforce that public officers and those in public service must keep up to date and keep current with their position and the, the requirements of the, the, the knowledge, the knowledge requirements, the whatever other requirements, physical requirements for some, because I don't want to get shot because you can't cheat me. If you understand what I'm saying. So let us positively reinforce certain requirements when it comes to public service and public office. Could we please have that type of language in our Constitution? Um, lastly, I notice that we are very, very sympathetic to those who uh, end up being arrested or detained on criminal charges, etc. Uh, we're very sympathetic to making sure that the Constitution speaks to due process in a timely manner. I don't see that for civil issues. So if I have a civil issue that I have brought, could there be something in the Constitution that also encourages the timeliness of the resolution of civil issues? Not because I am not in jail, does that mean that the court should drag its feet on a decision on a civil matter. It is costing me. Uh, Mr. Bradley, no, I'll hard you for that. 
because the longer that drag on, the more money he gets. But I, um, I, as a citizen, I reserve the right that judges, the judiciary, be held accountable to us as the people to deal with these matters in a time in a swift, as swiftly as possible. It is unfair that I have a good case, I know I will win my case, I get there, and adjournment, 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 adjournment. Now my grandchildren end up to take up the case. And all of that means that it that's coming out of my pocket. And then when you get the settlement, that settlement pays right back to Mr. Bradley. Well, you're the liar, boss, sorry. <laughs> okay, so could there please be something regarding the timeliness of decisions in civil matters? All right, because that is why we don't participate in the civil part of the judiciary a lot of the times because we can't afford it. All right, so you have people who are dying because of malpractice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what you let it go because you can't afford to carry that case to court because of how long the court will drag it out. All right, so that's my last request. Thank you very much. Jolie McDougall, Palote High School. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, Mr. Chair? I would just like to quickly say that the, we, we did a visit to the Belize Central Prison. We had an auditorium of 500 of our fellow Belizeans who have made poor choices and are locked up. But they're Belizeans and one day they're going to be out of the system. And so we felt it necessary to go and share with them the work that we're doing. There's 1,250 persons incarcerated in the central prison. And many of them have been waiting five, six, seven years and remand, not having been charged for a crime. But to the point made by the presenter, that's very valid. I just wanted to share that one of the things the Attorney General Ministry is doing is that they're now using the technology of tracking when a case gets before a judge and to track how long the judge takes to do the, 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 the case, to treat the case. So that then shows up as part of his work, her work, so there is some effort in that regard, but uh, your point is well taken, and um, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The mic is open for any more questions or comments. I think the, the dialogue so far has been very good. I'm glad to see people have the courage to come up, to ventilate their concerns, to give their opinions, uh, to share suggestions. Really, that's what these events are about. I see somebody to the back. Um, can we check if that mic is open? Uh, is Good afternoon, everyone. I am Francelia Canton, principal of Stella Marie School. Um, I want to touch on 11 and 12, says our right to work, we are protected against discrimination. When you look at section 16 in 3, subsection 3 I guess, it, um, it speaks to subject to disabilities or restriction to which persons of another such description are not made subject or accorded privileges or advantages which are not accorded to persons for another such, such description. Um, I'm sitting there, I didn't want to stand up, but I'm, I, I need to be an advocate for the children that we have entrusted in our care. Um, we recently graduated 22 children from our school. 
Only two of them got accepted at IT vet. The, the 20 other children will remain at home doing what? Um, we are doing a lot of skills program right now. We are training our children. I, I think some of our children right now can make better powder bun, um, flour tortilla and fried jack than most of us here because we're training them to do this. We are having the cosmetology, woodwork. Um, we were opening a snack shop with healthy stuff to eat and things like that. But my point is that there, I know from 2011, Belize has signed on to the right and ratified it in 2011. And we're in 2023. And there are a lot of establishments up, out there who do not employ our children. They do not hire them. There are some, excuse me, I know Mercado hired some, a few, a few. But I did a course, I did a training with JICA like three years ago. And I know in Japan, they have something in their constitution in regards to any establishment who hires persons with disabilities get like a quota they give them a little quota and they reimburse them if they hire people with disabilities they get reimbursed i know in mexico they um they would exempt them lower their taxes something we need to put in there to give them an incentive to hire our children they have a right they have a right just like anybody else so i believe from deep within that you can assist us and, and advocate for our children. We have 20 of them that will stay at home right now. I wish I can take them back to school and continue training them, but we're taking in students. So our, our school is small. We have 127 students right now enrolled and we're trying our best with them. But with your help, I know that we will give them a better opportunity and a better equal right. Thank you. Mr. Chair. The last speaker made a very important observation about the rights of the children, of the child, and the fact that Belize unique Belize, only in a Belize, was the first country in the world, would you believe that? To ratify the rights of the child. The first country in the world to ratify the rights of the child. On the PCC, we have the Women's Commission represented. And I want to share this fact with you, statistics. Because some of the problems you deal with in, in your classroom are created in the womb of children who are born into an environment that was not of their doing. I want you to take this home. Belize records 5,000 live births. That's our statistic per year. Ms. Ivory Bulwa, the Belize Women's Commission, tells me that 20% of those 5,000 live births are born to girls 13 years to 18 years. Any child 13 years, 14, 15, having children is against the law and against the rights of that child. How can we have a system for the last 25 years producing an justice to this child? Certainly I understand what the speaker said and certainly the constitution has to be more forcibly protecting the rights of the child. No 13 year old child should be having children to the expense where their bladders and other parts of their body get damaged. But that is a fact. And chances are some of those 
thousand children end up in your classroom. They got boom. Their rights need to be protected. Next speaker up. Hello. Good afternoon. So we all know teaching is a work of the heart. What you do in your classroom, we cannot be paid for. What we should be paid, we literally can't afford. However, now that I'm on this side of the stage, one of the suggestions that I would like to say, it's not directly in the Constitution, because remember, Constitution just dictates laws. I would like to know if anybody would like to join me in the request that in our laws, I believe it's some acronym, I'm not sure, TAPAS? the tax advisory thing, that certain public officers, <clears throat> such as teachers, should not be required to pay income tax. I, I think you got your response, Mrs. Usher. You know, we, we've, heard, we've heard this lament uh, when we were in Corozal. Many teachers that your co-workers got up and said the exact same thing, perhaps not as eloquently, and I've never seen this kind of reaction before, but they've said that the 25% is unjust. We've heard that. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Miss Denise Martin and I'm from City Verdant Technical High School. Um, I was browsing through our brief summary of the Constitution and I noticed that you guys have highlighted some food for thought and especially what got my attention was from section 34 that made mention of us changing from a governor general to a president. Um, we have noticed that in the past that sometimes when you throw things like these, it is already in the pipeline of happening. So I'm wondering if these things are just for us to consider or are these things our way forward? The food for thought. Um, there are several of them in here, and I have noticed, especially um, what caught my attention was section 34 that made mention of moving from a governor general to a president. Um, we have noticed in the past that majority of the time when you guys throw these things out, it's already in the pipeline of happening. So I'm wondering if these food for thought are simply for us to consider, or are these things our way forward? Well, I just wanted to reiterate what the chairman said, that the process of everything that's going here is a public consultation exercise. And the no end of that, after the statutorily provided period, I believe it's 18 months, is that a report would be submitted to the, national, to the cabinet for onward submissions to the National Assembly. And then ultimately, it is the executive and the legislature that decides. On your question though, one of the things that I do want to say is at previous presentations of the PCC, there has been this debate between a parliamentary system of government and a presidential system of government. Both systems of government have advantages and disadvantages. And you would see that countries in our region have undergone substantial transformations to their constitution. For example, within the last two years, Barbados has 
moved away from England as their constitutional monarchy, and they've embraced a quasi-parliamentary presidential system. That is, of course, something I believe that's in the document for the public to consider and give comment on. When there are presentations about those structures, you get a sense of how an effective structure of government can promote pluralism, more inclusion, more consultation, and a more participatory form of government. But that, of course, I believe is put in the literature for people to give their comments on. And I know specific consultations, people have asked questions about that, and there have been presentations about whether or not the form of government, the parliamentary system of government, is effective. What is its shortfalls? Should we keep with that? Should there be changes? Should there be minor changes? And of course, that is within the purview of public consultation. Could we invite somebody else to come up to share uh, questions or comments? Sorry, I forgot one point. Um, I was happy when I heard about all the different language that we use, but I'm talking about can and shall and may. Okay. Before I get to my point, I would like to ask, you, you all have experience, well, you all have experience, but I'm asking you all, do you have experience with children? Or have you ever sent them to look for something? Most of the time they come back and they can't find it. All right? And so then, you need to re-strategize and figure out how to state what you want to happen so that they get it done. you find it or else. What I would like is a change in the language here when it says that with respect to the environment, peace and security that the, the government is to seek to eliminate. Really, they just are look for a way to eliminate economic and social privilege and that's all they're in they're required to do look and then they can come back and say we're not finding it so what i would like the language to state i would like the language to mandate that they act to eliminate economic and social privilege and disparity among us. Not seek to find it, but act to eliminate it. I really would love for that language to change because government after government after government will come to me and say, I looked, but I can't find. All right? So please, thank you. My question is based on a situation that took place about two, three years ago with the indigenous people of Belize. And this situation for me, when I heard the final decisions made by the court, for me personally, it was like a slap in the face in the sense that at the end of the decision certain indigenous group was even granted finances from the government because their claim was that they were indigenous for me I was taken aback because it is like a downgrade in the sense that because you or your ancestors were not indigenous to this country, they cannot request certain amenities. Right? Yes, because we came here or brought here, we were brought here. So um, 
Yes, for me, that was an attack to the Constitution itself. So how can the Constitution reflect procedures that will prevent things like this from keep happening or occurring? Well, you don't remember the situation. Some of the situation occurred down south when they wanted to do the seismic testing. And from those situations, the Mayans, they were granted a certain amount of money from the government first, which we are the ones that paid that just because they were indigenous. For me, that was unfair. Then, because of that, certain statements were being thrown around where the alcaldes were um, projecting that if anybody wants to pass through their set of the country, they needed to get permission from, hey, we are all Belizean. They should never have given the opportunity to even make statements like that because we don't tell them if they want to pass through our central Belize. They need to come to the village council or they need to come to the city council or town council to get permission to pass through. We are all believers, and so those statements came because those people were allowed to make certain requests under the, 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 the guise that they are indigenous, while because this group here is not indigenous, they can't make certain requests. And for me, as I said, that was an attack, not just against the, the regular laws or act of our country, that was an attack, a challenge to the constitution itself. So how can the Constitution, my question is, how can the Constitution um, be written in a way where things like these will not slip through your fingers? Is, is there a reaction from the panel on that, that question? I think he almost run with a battery. But one of the things that I just wanted to say is that that issue is complicated. One of the points that I do want to emphasize though is that the constitution guarantees every person equality before the law. And it provides that no person or group shall be discriminated against. So that what the Mayan community have done is that they have used the lawful processes of court to argue successfully that because of certain practices, their right to equality before the law and non-discrimination has been violated. And they have been successful. And the courts and the government are reconciling what their rights are. I think that that will be a long process. The law requires the establishment of a commission and there's, that is going to be something, I believe the first case for Mayan Aboriginal rights was from 1990 something. And there've been a series of cases, including recent cases that gone all the way to the Caribbean Court of Justice. The point is that nothing that they have done has not been through the process of law. They have used the democratic rule of law court system to advance their right, including their right to be treated with respect as indigenous peoples. And the same right that they have, it is the right that every one of us have if we feel that we are being treated discriminatorily. One of the things that I just wanted to add here very quickly, and I tell my son and daughter this, if a tree falls, in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it does it make a song and my son and daughter always gets confused the point that I'm making is that if a right exists and it is not asserted does it matter the people in the Mayan community have advanced their rights and they've used the democratic process which every single Belizean has as their right and they've been successful there is nothing 
that is untoward about that. It is a right of due process and they have gone to the court and they have been vindicated in certain sectors. And that has to be recognized, it has to be appreciated, but it comes under this fundamental right that no person shall be discriminated against. If you are mestizo, Maya, Creole, man, woman, your right has to be recognized. And the law recognizes everyone equally, including indigenous Belizeans. Yeah, good afternoon, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Kendra Forbes here. Kindly correct me if I missed something. And let me know under which section this would come under without saying it. I am going to pick up from what my, one of my colleagues said earlier about paying tax. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of teachers here right now is still not finished with their classroom. And I'm gonna say primary school teachers at that. I searched this document to look for a specific statement that says, teachers are not allowed to fix their classroom and don't tell me that they have given us some of money that must be passed to them to fix the classroom it's not enough so in relation to section 121 please help me here code of conduct b it says compromise the fair exercise of their public of their public or official functions and duties we are going to be told that it is our duty to get the classroom done. We will be told that it is our duty to formulate the lesson plans to teach the children. Now I want to get to the point of our teacher's spiritual well-being. Where is that in here? We spend thousands of dollars. Right now I have $25 in my pocket and I need to get my uniform. Ah, my, nothing get done for me yet. And we have to take care of people's children. I know that you said that this is a political document, but that has to do with fundamental rights, um, uh, functions and duties. It is our duty, they will tell us, to fix the classroom. We're in this constitution, and please tell me, don't go to BNTU. I mean, that's a part of me. But teachers, it is up to us. I not finish my, well, I finish my classroom, almost finish. What, where in this could help me? And the petition, one person will stand up and speak. Everybody and listen, right? Just like how they listen. I want the time to move, nobody move. That we, that we control this thing. So what will happen if we get up one day and say we're not going to work? What is being, what? We're not protected, we say we're protected, but we're not really protected. I got $25. Help me, please. I know, I know CT now. We spend, we spend, really, we spend at least $500 and odd dollars for charts alone. Charts alone. So, please help me to understand where this commander code of conduct. At the minute a teacher begins to rant and rave, they're gonna take out the section this of that to come and remind us of our school rules, which is still political because it has to come from the Ministry of Education, which has to be formulated and being, um, what's the word? It has to be approved by someone. So when you tell me that the document is political everything is political we are a democratic country thank you for that are there any reaction from the panel on that point i just wanted to i just wanted to correct something quickly i didn't say that the constitution is political I said that the rights are political rights. They don't deal with economic rights nor social rights. And so it is perfectly permissible if you want to comment, and that's something I'm sure that the PCC will note, that you want to broaden the provisions in the Constitution to include other than political rights. 
it could include those things if you want. That, that's something that anyone is free to make a comment about. But the point that I was making is that the rights are political rights. Thank you for that. We will take this last question and then that will close the, the question and answer segment. So please go ahead. Greetings, everyone. I just want to talk about the right to privacy. That has been an issue at Sadie Vernon Technical High School with our teachers. We are asked to have set up all these uh, chat groups with our students and they have access to our phone numbers, private phone numbers. When will the Ministry of Education give each and every one of our teachers a device that we can use to do that? What, what we can do now is, if there are any last, well, closing, closing remarks from the panel to close this question and answer segment, are there any final comments, closing remarks, before we, we, we close off this section? Just by way of a quick closing to echo the sentiments of the chairman that this is a consultation process and it's meant to be meaningful and your consultations, your comments, your views informs the commission of what is to include in the report. That whatever you say, however you say it, and one of the things that I love about this session this afternoon is that reasonable people may disagree, but it is the input and it is the process that is important. And I just want to thank everybody for attending this session this afternoon. I appreciated the dialogue, I appreciated the engagement, the interactions, the comments, and the only point that I will leave you with is that the process is as important as the end result. If we can have a meaningful process of consultation, if we can engage one another with respect and dignity and appreciate that we are a diverse society with different people and different ideas, but we can all coalesce and live together and formulate a report and a document that reflects what we want in our constitution, I think that that process itself will be a victory. And that process will reflect what type of nation we are, that we are a nation that respects the rule of law, that respects rights, and that respects each other. So I encourage you to participate in the other consultation process, to give your input, and to take back this information to your space your classroom, your work environment, your family, and to continue to have these discussions and to have an impact because the Constitution is about you and it is about what you want in your society. I just, make, I just want to make an observation. Um, going around the country, and I've been to like seven different presentations. I just want to make an observation. Under section 15 of the Constitution, it provides for the protection of a right to work. And a teacher stood up in Corozal and said, we should have a right to education also, and right to health. And I noticed that a similar um, right to education, probably in different words, were brought up here today. So what I have seen is a, an observe is there is this continuous um, request that perhaps the Constitution could be amended to include the right to health and the right to education in a similar way as Section 15, which provides the protection of the right to work. So. I just wanted to make that observation. And then I would like to say again, thank you all for coming out. You are persons who are thinking. And um, I enjoyed some of your comments. And I know that these comments come from a deep place in your heart and in your being. And so once more, I want to say thank you very much for your attention and for coming. 
Well, that, that closes the question and answer segment for this afternoon. I've always known teachers to be courageous and outspoken, and I think everybody here demonstrated just that with their ability to come out and ventilate their concerns. So from my heart to yours, thank you very much. And it was a pleasure being a moderator this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Pot. And thank you, teachers. We now proceed to the thank you, which will be done by Mrs. Arlette Bevans Mazaya, Vice President of BNTU Belize Branch. Good evening. I stand before you with a grateful heart and appreciation for the opportunity to address you guys today. <clears throat> On behalf of all the participants, I would like to extend our heartfelt thank you to our presenters, Mr. Usher and Mr. Bradley, attorneys at law, and Mrs. Jamie Usher from Belize High School. Chair Anthony Chanona, our esteemed BNTU staff, including our national president, Commissioner Ruth Schumann, and our national treasurer, Ms. Keisha Williams, the Belize branch executive, especially our able president, Mrs. Tanya flowers Jillip, and our assistant secretary, who is also our MC for today, Ms. Vanisha Rayburn. Thanks to the commissioner, Maria Zabani, for her extraordinary collaboration in helping to put together today's event. Dr. Christopher DeShield for spearheading the Education Technical Committee, Commissioner Joshua Pott for assisting in the planning of the session, and last but certainly not least, the People's Constitution Committee Secretariat for their incredible work. This event has been a helpful source of knowledge and inspiration, leaving us enriched in more ways than one. Once again, thank you for all your contributions, for your passion, and for your commitment to the betterment of education. Let's continue to strive for excellence in our respective fields, united by the common goal of shaping the future through education. Thank you. <clears throat> 